<sighs> Ever notice that the New World Order is like a really bad door-to-door -door salesman? We have before us the opportunity to forge for ourselves and for future generations a New World Order that just won't leave you alone and go away? They're more like that nosy neighbor that peeps on you with binoculars, cross with the creepy door-to-door -door salesman. We established a liberal world order and that hadn't happened in a long while. A lot of people dying, but nowhere near the chaos. And now is a time when things are shifting. We're gonna, there's gonna be a new world order out there. It's a never-ending battle, all in the name of freedom, and really just wanting to be left Come on, alone. Man. And not spied on. Breaking the law in order to violate people's rights, that's the new world normal. Please, at least leave us alone in our living rooms. Let me have my toaster and my TV and my steel-belted radios and I won't say anything. Just leave us alone. I'm a human being, God damn it! My life has value! We were warned. The CIA relies heavily on the NSA's ability to gather vast quantities of email, phone calls, and other data to track down terrorists. The CIA's drone program relies heavily on data the NSA provides. That includes phone calls, emails, and other forms of signals intelligence. But we didn't listen. And now we live in a dystopia. Like, why would you just use it on potential criminals or enemies of the state or what have you? Well, you could use it on the entire fucking population and make trillions of dollars in advertiser revenue. Well, what about when you talk about something and then you get an ad for that something that you've never seen an ad for before? With email service providers and social media, we've long been told that if it's free, you're the product. But with the Internet of Things, it seems even if you pay, you're still the product. A real-life science fiction movie. It really goes back to the data. So we have a direct connection with our consumers that provides us with deterministic first-party data. So we utilize that for targeting. How did we get here? The personal computer, originally designed to raise the intellect of humanity, has been transformed into smart devices designed to raise the intellect of artificial intelligence instead. In order to correct the AI, Google felt that they needed to re-rank all of the data. This has massive implications for society. Companies are modifying their behavior to ingratiate themselves with those in power. They're changing their slogans and advertisements. They're censoring content. They're firing controversial people. Speak up, you might lose your job because you're bad for the company's ESG score. Now it's all about politics and hysteria. What we thought could make us more connected made us more divided. Instead of people using technology for their benefit, Technology now uses people for it. watching you. Music, movie streaming services, online shopping services routinely look at your pattern of behavior, compares that to previous customers, and tries to make predictions for you. Google runs the largest of all the ad exchanges, also known as surveillance advertising. Big social media platforms don't sell ads to you. They sell you to advertisers. This technology is designed to collect as much information about you as possible, then analyze it with artificial intelligence to create predictive models of your behavior and preferences. This is you. 
a series of purchases, preferences, and quantifiable data points that we define as your personality. We monitor every social network, internet logs, instant and text messages, known associates, your friends, emails received and sent, cell phone usage. We use this data to form personality profiles. We know who you are. We are everywhere. The thing is, you're not just following your bad guy targets, you're also following their metadata. And by the time you go a third hop out from the original target, you're looking at a list of 2.5 million people. This is a commercialized version of the very same technology that in previous versions used cell phone, email, and social media data to target terrorists with a predator drone. The CIA's drone program relies heavily on data the NSA provides. That includes phone calls, emails, and other forms of signals intelligence. But now, instead of delivering you a smart bomb, Avon calling. it delivers you a smart ad through smart devices. And that's just the beginning. And nearly every TV sold these days is a smart TV. And if you're not using a smart TV, you might plug in one of these, an Amazon Fire Stick, Roku, or Google Chromecast. But all these devices are grabbing a lot of information about you, what shows you watch, when you're watching, and how long even your voice. According to their terms of service, those smart devices use that information for a range of reasons, including analytics, marketing, and targeted advertising. They can share that data with countless third-party firms. Your privacy and behavioral data is monetized and sold to governments, corporations, and advertising agencies. This is a very dangerous weapon to put at the hands of the powers that be. We've really been building back-end big data analytic capabilities now for a couple of years. We get the data through 30,000 sources. Not just the typical data that you find in a database, but other data that you can get about your customers. Major financial institutions and companies give us accounts for complex for Apple. Google is now saying it's going to spend 13 billion dollars money for data centers. And that's where a lot of these data lakes come in. Data is a data is a huge asset for us. From your own data sources and from outside third party data sources, you can bring that together and get business value out of that. And we combine this unstructured data that I just talked about right. with that accounts receivable data and suddenly we've got a rich profile. So you want to do data crunching? Right. Um, Basically, Amazon is the world's biggest supercomputer available right now. Right. And that, you be, you're able to use that data. You turn on the data sources you need. Within a couple of hours, you have the analysis you need. exploitation of its vast trove of data to promote its own merchandise at the expense of other sellers. Amazon is now 50% of all e-commerce. Amazon has been forcing third-party sellers to enter into contracts that penalize them if they try to sell their products on other sites for cheaper prices. And that includes a company's own website. For every euro of sales, Hubacher has to hand over 30 cents to Amazon. Amazon is one of the most valuable companies in the world, along with Apple, Google, and Facebook. They're worth together around $7 trillion. The success of software can depend on its presence in the App Store, for which Apple charges 15 to 30% of revenue. And essentially it tells us if you don't like the deal, you can just get out of here. You can just shut down your business. How is that a choice? Does it just felt like Mafia tactics. The tech companies decide under what conditions others can enter their system. In the process, they collect oceans of data. They invade our private lives through surveillance. They extract from our lives, rendering what they extract as behavioral data. And then they claim those behavioral data as their private property. The way you live your life, the way you do your work, 
the way research and development are all moving forward. It all relies on this enormous amount of data and this enormous amount of computing power. Guess who else has access to your privacy and behavioral data? So one of the things that we were able to do with the Smart TV platform was actually um, abuse the, the browser it, to, to the extent that we could actually gain access to the camera that's built into the TV. This is something that we can do invisibly and actually have the camera running behind the web page that you're, that you're looking at. I could be sitting on a laptop in a cafe in Paris, and as long as I have a network connection, I'd be able to get into your TV and access the camera. Hackers, spy agencies, you name it, anyone, anywhere around the world. This data is pretty valuable, not just to device makers, but to hackers. If you're watching your smart TV, somebody may be into your device. The FBI recommends putting a piece of black tape over the camera eye if you can't turn off the camera. And that you're covering those microphone holes. Also make sure you unplug it. Ah, okay. I'm, I'm Santa Claus. Don't you want to be my best friend? The horrifying sound coming from this ring security camera installed in the child's bedroom. Until two weeks ago, Danielle's home in Portland, Oregon was wired in every room with the Amazon Echo. Her family used the Alexa app to do everything from turn up the heat to turn off the lights. But that their love for the Alexa changed with one alarming phone call. That person was one of her husband's employees calling from Seattle. He proceeded to tell us that he had received... Um, audio files, recordings from what was going on in our house. It's nearly impossible to distinguish between consumer products and surveillance equipment. It's really easy to forget that normal household items are spying on you. Look at all these products. Can you see a single microphone or camera? There is an entire economy for spy footage of people. Couples being intimate, people going to the bathroom. For many people, this is much more than just perversion. This is a business. Your privacy is being studied, monetized, and sold. Data collection has become so sophisticated that NGOs are now using AI algorithms that can accurately predict or even interfere with election outcomes. Do you really have a file on every voter in this country? Yeah. Yes. And, and if you just pick one at random, how, how much would it say about an individual? Literally, you could look and there would be, you could look into thousands of characteristics. Thanks to advances in data analysis and digital communications, it's now becoming possible for political leaders to capture the expressions of all American minds. So where does the house by house data come from? An amazing range of sources, among them supermarket and credit card transactions and what people watch on TV. Data analysis was pioneered in the two triumphant Obama campaigns. They even boasted they knew the names of all 69 million people who voted for Obama. We had 12 people on our data team in 2008. We had 165 in 2012. Wow. We ended up using all that data to change the way we dealt with voters. Where Mitch Stewart was Obama's director sort of, of battleground states. I had reports every single night that went all the way down to the volunteer level in every single state. Um, and so I could see exactly how many doors were knocked, how many conversations they had, what were the results of those conversations, and then that rolled all the way up to a national report. But the Republican side say they've now caught up on big data, especially through their psychological profiling. So depending on what personality type you have, we can take messaging on a particular policy or issue and and then tweak it. So if these tech companies have our lifetime location tracking data, as well as access to live cell phone ping geolocation tracking data, as well as all of our social media posts, and including our private conversations that we have in proximity to our smart devices, imagine what they could do with all of that data on, say, election night. They could have a common operational picture of who's already voted at early voting, who is likely to vote a certain way and who's not likely to vote another way. In fact, by midnight, they would know whose ballots need to be stuffed into which box in order to get them the election outcome they so desire. 
significantly more data has come in between 2012 through 2016 and into 2018. Political analytics has boomed as an industry over this period of time. We talked earlier about the importance of being able to model the behavior of the entire electorate in order to understand what states are going to have close elections, where we can effectively allocate resources. We're moving to a data warehouse built on Google BigQuery uh, so that fundamentally, people can interact with all of this data for analysts and data scientists and to provide an, a foundation that people can build on top of and can do new innovative work uh, that pushes the bounds of political data forward and drives political strategy as a result. Do you remember when Facebook was all about family and friends? Little did we know that would all turn out to be a nightmare. In 2015, Matt Drudge made a rare and unannounced appearance on The Alex Jones Show warning about social media and how mass internet censorship was on the horizon. I'm not on Facebook. Um, I don't do the socials. I've got that little Twitter thing. Even that's kind of disgusting. You know, I've been doing the internet as long as you've been doing this radio show, Alex. I was there before Facebook. I was there for before CNN.com. I was there before mostly all of them. I have a very clear perception what the internet is. There is a lot of corporate makeover of the internet that I have not adapted to. I need no traffic from Google or Bing or Yahoo or any of these others. It's always been that way. Now, if you think of that setup how rare that is, because everybody's so hungry for referrals. This whole social media stuff is bogus. Make your own playground. The internet allows you to make your own dynamic, your own universe. Why are you gravitating towards somebody else's stop operating in their playground? Stop it. We were warned not to be corralled into their platforms, that we needed to make our own digital space. But instead, we kept feeding their machine, giving it more and more of our data. We knew they could censor us, but we didn't care. We could just keep making new profiles, bouncing from platform to platform, hide behind anonymity, and turn it into a game of whack-a-mole. In 2016, I made a name for myself as an independent journalist on social media. This is Millie Weaver reporting. I essentially went out and covered political rallies and events, things that the mainstream media wouldn't show. This is exactly showing the fact that she really does not have that much support. Hillary Clinton is on stage right now as we speak, and she is coughing nonstop. I'm just concerned that some of this is deep state controlled opposition. Um, I'm concerned that deep state could be having their hands in both sides of this. Don't you think that it's within the president's first amendment for him to criticize oh, and certainly. make Absolutely. comment against yes. the media? Absolutely. It's well within his first yeah. amendment rights to make comments about the media. I think it's really good to be policing the press though and speech. I'm sorry, we got to go. Do you think it's good to be policing free speech? Well, I think um, the fact that you asked that question really uh, underscores that you see what I see there, and I think most people do. I have meetings this week with members of Congress and a couple senators to uh, talk about all of the uh, big tech tyranny and the violation of, of American citizens' rights online. We know the big tech is trying to even censor oh, you they, and they, your they, work. They've, they've, um, they took down my Twitter. Suspended, was it, Eric? Suspended our Twitter account, locked it. I was at ground zero when social media censorship began. I watched how these social media platforms went from being a free speech platform into a completely controlled and censored dystopic nightmare. It was a concern early on that social media would become a breeding ground for terrorism and child exploitation. Technologies were created to help mitigate this new potential for a serious threat. Back in 2008, we developed uh, a photo DNA. It was a hashing technology that allowed us to identify any image in a sea of really billions and billions of images. So eGlyph is a technology that takes photo DNA and it adapts it to be able to extract these signatures from video and audio recordings. Prior to our development of eGlyph, the tech company says there's nothing we can do about terror content. 
And as soon as we developed eGlyph and publicized it, well, guess what? They developed similar technology and have claimed to be deploying it and, and using it. It quickly became apparent social media companies prioritized profit over people. To be honest, Dave, the tech companies have, have claimed they've been doing some prevention of upload, that they've been make, you know, doing different artificial intelligence mechanisms, but we were trying to really just get at the data and actually see what is actually still happening on the platform. As the study shows, there's still a lot of work to be done. They took this new technology designed to target terrorism and child exploitation and turned it around to target their own political opponents instead. Twitter had a lot of child pornography and a lot of people will be like, oh, maybe they were accounts or pictures. No, they're videos. And in this article that I published right back on March 6, 2020, I had put screenshots, obviously obfuscating the identity of the children. After I published that article, my account on Twitter was banned. The same technology that we developed to counter child pornography can be used to counter extremism, hate, and lots of other things. It is agnostic as to what it looks for. And so we have developed this very powerful technology that is capable of making these platforms safer. Implementing a new form of social control, cancel culture. When I saw Alex Jones get banned on social media, I knew that he was the canary in the coal mine and that we were all next. Infowars got knocked off of Google Ads through AdRoll, their subsidiary company they work with. And so they took that, that ad program, strangely enough, was just about all the extra money we had to budget for expansion in 2017. And it wasn't just that Alex Jones was banned on a handful of social media platforms. He was banned unilaterally across multiple platforms all simultaneously. That means it was orchestrated. In 2018, Big Tech demonstrated a never before seen capability. One of several companies today, including Apple, Spotify, and YouTube that are limiting the content of far right podcast Infowars and the face of that company, Alex Jones. Facebook is purging several high profile names from its platform. These companies are under a great deal of pressure to police the kind of content that appears on their sites and services. You know, this is unfolding as the perfect crisis management for Apple. Apple last night removed the entire library of Alex Jones's podcast from their store. YouTube took you away. Facebook removed you. Yes. Twitter. Yes. Uh, and then we keep going back. Spotify, I mean, uh, Apple. It wasn't just social media. It was payment processors, too. And they're now taking away your payment system as well. Is that correct? There were six, six payment platforms. And they've taken five. Tech companies simultaneously in coordination deleted a single person. And they're planning to roll that out against other conservatives where they put a terror mark on you. And it wasn't just Alex Jones. I have been banned by Uber, I've been banned by Lyft, I've been temporarily banned by Facebook, Venmo, PayPal. 90% of my income came through PayPal. I've been banned on GoFundMe. Others were getting canceled too. At the time, the media pretended that cancel culture was a myth. So the problem with cancel culture is the same as the problem with the Loch Ness Monster, the Boogeyman, any other thing that doesn't exist because cancel culture does not actually exist. But it was real, very real. My life is ruined! Does anybody understand how ruined my life is? I'm sick of it. I don't want to listen to people tell me that I'm a conspiracy theorist. They don't know what it's like to be me. Not only were we watching big tech demonstrate their ability to unilaterally marginalize someone, but worse, it appeared the whole thing was designed to do just that. In an instant, you can be canceled. It's a fate that comes with personal and financial cost. I've made a severe and continuous lapse in my judgment. Raw and emotional. And that's what this video is here to do, to address it, to say that I am sorry. I'm disappointed in myself because it seems like I've learned nothing from all these past controversies. I owe everybody an explanation. These apologies posted on social I media. I stronger and a better person and a better friend. Their alleged wrongs, all different. Their sentence, the same. Cancellation. You can make or break people permanently. 
Twitter permanently banning the commander in chief's personal account with 88 million followers. President Trump moved quickly to post from the official POTUS account. Those tweets taken down within minutes. There are eight steps towards Internet blacklisting designed to maintain information dominance and social control. You won't mind if I take a look at your online social media posts. Why? It's just something we do as a matter of course nowadays. It gives us extra insight into whoever we're bringing on board. These steps are purposefully executed with vagueness and ambiguity as to make one question their own judgment. The first step is shadow banning. For anyone who is not in the mix with the angry side of social media, this whole concept must sound bizarre. But there is a real thing called shadow banning. An admin could make it so no one else will see that user's future posts. It's like turning the user into a ghost, but they don't know they're dead. And maybe they'll get the point that they're unwanted when everyone stops interacting with them, or they'll just get bored and bother someone else. The second step is permanent suspension or restricted from being on certain websites or platforms. The tech giant Facebook announced today individuals will be banned for spreading hate speech on both Facebook and Instagram. Off you go. The third step is permanent suspension or restriction from online payment services. PayPal has shut down the account of the Free Speech Union, as well as the account of its founder, Toby Young, over alleged COVID vaccine misinformation. This is just part of a broader trend where the misinformation police in this country are first coming after your social media accounts to prevent you from being able to share your opinions, but now we're going the next step to your financial accounts, stopping you from being able to even transact and being a member of the modern economy. Goodbye. The fourth step is permanent restriction from web hosting networks. Frankly, when you manage the DNS, of uh, the, d the domain name space of, uh, of the address of somebody, you can, you can take them offline. So in many cases when we don't host the website and we do host the domain and we have 71 million domains, 17 million customers, that uh, will take it down. The fifth step, exclusion from browser search results. I want to remind you, this is not what free speech is because Google is not the government yet. <laughs> and neither is GoDaddy. So these are private businesses. If they don't want to work with you, they don't have to work with you. The sixth step is when an internet service provider restricts access to restricted content. I am not shedding a tear that that content isn't on online anymore. But one of my fellow employees um, came up to me the day that we, we talk, took it offline and said, hey, is this the day the internet dies? There was no due process. You woke up one morning and you said, this is bad and I'm gonna do something about it. Fuck them, they're off the internet. The seventh step is when individuals are restricted from electronic devices. So here's what Apple is doing specifically in terms of actions in response, pausing all product sales in Russia. Also, Apple says last week we stopped all exports into our sales channel into the country. Apple Pay and other services have been limited. Russia Today News and Sputnik News are no longer available for download on the App Store outside of Russia. And Apple says it has disabled both traffic and live incidents in Apple Maps in Ukraine. The eighth and final step is anyone who attempts or gives unauthorized access to restricted individuals is subject to punishment. Constantly monitored by facial recognition cameras that are able to instantly put a face to a name, given a mark out of a possible 950 points. A good score brings benefits, but people with low scores lose rights. The cinema names and shames people considered untrustworthy, plastering their details, even their addresses across big screens. It's only right to pay your debts. You have to blacklist those that don't. Among them is this journalist Liu Hu. He got a little too close to uncovering corruption among high-profile party members. He was blacklisted. He only realized when he tried to buy a train ticket and was told he was banned from traveling.
my parents were actually banned from Airbnb yesterday for being related to me. I was banned from the site three years ago for my political activism and they just got a notification that their booking had been canceled and it was due to being closely associated with someone who was not allowed on the site. Many chalked it up as sensationalism or conspiracy theories that these were extreme examples or isolated incidents of bad actors getting removed for violating terms of service, not recognizing that this was the beginning of something much more sinister. In 2019, senior software engineer at YouTube and Google, Zach Voorhees, came forward as a whistleblower revealing Google had created an artificial intelligence system to classify all available data to Google search so they could re-rank the entire internet. August of 2019 with Project Veritas and we basically gave the American public all 950 pages of exactly how Google does their censorship and their re-ranking of search results. And the name of that was called Machine Learning Fairness. And this was being used on Google search. It was being used on Google news. It was being used on YouTube and the American public had no idea. And they also didn't have any idea that Google was intent on rolling this out everywhere um, and turning the censorship from like a one to all the way up to an 11. They even thought that ob objectively true information was algorithmically unfair. And I remember that there was this uh, internal frequently asked question about you know, this machine learning fairness. And they said, well, hey, can um, objective reality be algorithmically unfair? The answer to that was yes. And so they're going to reconstruct that reality based upon their corporate values. And they didn't let us know this. They didn't ask us for permission. They just sort of did it thereby deploying on their platforms the necessary tools to implement information dominance. So we got a hold of Noam Chomsky, and he spoke out even about Alex Jones being banned and censored off of multiple platforms. A friend of Gavin Wentz and Millie Weaver that they've known for many years, have actually uh, you know, already done some work with this fella. And he said, no, I was talking to Noam Chomsky, and he basically wrote me a letter back in defense uh, of your free speech. Doesn't mean Noam Chomsky agrees with you. You recently signed on to a letter uh, decrying cancel culture. There's overwhelming resort to cancel culture on the part of the mainstream establishment. It's their bread and butter. What I understood the letter to be about is kind of a anodyne comment in favor of freedom of expression aimed at telling small segments of the left that they're making a mistake, both in principle and tactically, if they adopt the principles of the mainstream. They're making a mistake. And I say it all the time to people on the left, I see nothing wrong with signing a letter that says we should defend free speech. But what they did say was, is that you have these big multinational combines and these big monopolies that are coming together and doing all of this to use me as the case point example to set the precedent to ban free speech. I was at the hearing when Google CEO Sondar Pichai testified before Congress regarding social media censorship and privacy. Sundar, you will not silence the people. There's Sundar Pichai your, right there. Your, your censorship will not work anymore, Sundar. We're aware of your activities trying to muzzle the American people and gaming your search results. Google is evil. Google is evil. Mr. Pichai, is it true that the Android operating system sends Google information every few minutes detailing the exact... In a hearing with Google CEO Sundar Pichai, it was acknowledged that these devices can not only tell which building you are in, but they can also tell the floor that you're on and even the ambient temperature of the room. Do you think the average consumer understands that Google will collect this volume of detailed information when they click through the terms of service agreements in order to use the Android operating system? 160 million users went to, went to their My Account settings where they can clearly see what information we have. More importantly, if they decide to stop using it, we work hard to make it possible 
hope you work hard to make it possible for users to take their data with them if they choose to use another service. There was this awkward moment in the room when everyone there realized that Google had the ability to spy on everyone there using their devices, including U.S. representatives. Does Google track my movement? Does Google, through this phone, know that I have moved here and moved over to the left? I wouldn't be able to answer without looking at... Uh, you can't say yes or no. Uh, without knowing more details. Uh. But see, they say it's not spying because users unknowingly agree to it in their terms of service agreements. The privacy settings on your iPhone or Android devices may not be enough. Turns out Google is recording your movements even when you explicitly tell it not to. That's what an Associated Press investigation revealed today. Is it time to break up big tech? Of course, the big tech players don't think they need to be broken up. They argue their dominance isn't guaranteed because new competitors can easily jump in. As Google likes to point out, competition is just one click away. Many created new websites, several created new social media platforms, and some even created new payment processing systems. However, every single proposed solution fell short by not dealing with the fundamental underlying problem, the devices and the network itself. I started researching and looking into a solution for the social media censorship problem. Little did I know, in order to actually deal with the problem, you actually have to replace the entire system, including the electronic devices. And nobody was prepared to do that. I think losing your app store um, privileges and losing your web host is about as close to a kiss of death as you can get in the world of apps. Amazon became the latest tech giant to notify Parler it was suspending its account. Apple and Google banned Parler from their app stores. Apple, by the way, has reinstated Parler to get back onto Apple. I believe you've agreed to more aggressive patrolling of users' posts. Apple requested that the version of the app that is posted on the App Store, that will be posted on the App Store here in the next week or so, will have a particular kind of content censorship that is required by Apple. Google isn't yet approving True Social to be added to its App Store. Now, Google is citing content moderation concerns. Truth Social is now on Google's Play Store, but for how long, yeah. Martin? And President Trump says he will not return to Twitter despite having his account reinstated. So I don't know how it's going to end up. Don't be surprised if someone from Truth Social reaches out to Elon Musk and says, why doesn't Twitter just buy the president's Truth Social so that we can all be one big happy family? As a result, millions of Twitter users are exploring another little-known platform called Mastodon. No one person or company owns Mastodon. The servers all link up to form a kind of collective network, but they're all owned by individuals and different organisations. This does mean that you can be at the whim of whoever owns your server. Do you want this? One, two, three, four, five, wide awake. Buckle your seatbelt, Dorothy. To create a solution, one must fully understand the problem. In order to understand what really happened and how it pertains to these current events, we must first go back in time. As you know, in order to develop an interactive network such as the Internet, you first need interactive computers. In the 1950s, the only way to do that was to let people use computers one at a time. Many of us scratched our heads about how to make a more versatile system, but nobody came up with an answer until John McCarthy wrote a memo on January 1st, 1959, that told how to do it. His motivation was not to revolutionize the world of computing, but to find a more efficient way to conduct his research in artificial intelligence. That note inspired a number of groups in the MIT community to develop time-sharing systems. Well, what we are trying to develop is a new scheme of using the computer, which we call time-sharing. In the 1960s, computer scientists figured out how time-sharing could give multiple users simultaneous access to computers by retaining each user's information in the core memory as the computer switched between users rapidly. 
I became the Stanford University representative on the startup committee for ARPANET, the first general purpose computer network, which worked exclusively with time sharing systems at various academic institutions. This not only leads to personal computers and the internet, but handheld devices and cloud services as well. With the introduction of personal computers in the 1980s, people began to connect directly to the internet. Many seem to think this was a fundamental change, but I disagree. Since the core of the network continued to be time-sharing systems, which did all the heavy lifting. However, by then we were shortening the names of time-sharing systems to servers. More recently, the term cloud computing has been introduced as part of a pretense that a new kind of service is being offered. However, it is actually plain old time-sharing under another name. The important new idea introduced by John McCarthy in 1959 unpredictably initiated a major revolution in how people interact with computers. Some colleagues and I have backgrounds in manufacturing, specifically with exotic materials and customized electronics, research and development. I also happen to know a lot of top-notch computer scientists, software engineers, and software developers. I reached out to everyone to see if we could come up with some kind of a solution, something along the lines of a 10-year solution, not just some quick fix. With my particular background, I could see there was a deeper problem at hand, something more existential than just data collection. The systematic problem we face with our electronics I started my work on artificial intelligence in about 56. When computers came along, computers have certainly had a profound effect on psychology, regarding the self as an object uh, in the world. This mystery is basically the mystery of a child's inner space. The machine in resonance with the child, and he with it, represents a dynamic extension of his own inner space. I have a master's degree in consciousness studies from a prestigious graduate program organized by renowned academics from Berkeley, Princeton, MIT, and the Stanford Research Institute. Cutting edge computer scientists, neuroscientists, physicists, and aerospace engineers, such as former professor and personal friend, Harold Dean Brown, one of the inventors of the microchip, the Zilog Z80. We started a program here at SRI to explore the uses of the computer in the classroom. It must be placed on the computer as a humanistic tool. The microprocessor extends the intellectual capacities, the brain power of human beings, thus extending the human reach. Another being linguist and cryptanalyst, Lewis Perry, former colleague of David Bohm, student and friend of Noam Chomsky, and many others. Your Esalen Institute types, old school classic liberal diehards, anti censorship and hardcore free speech advocates. Whose brain's better to pick than the back channel of the intellectual and academic left? When we talk about how computers work, you can't get around imputing internal states to them. Computers have memories, they have goal states, they execute plans, and if you could do that, about a hunk of metal and you're not being unscientific, why should it be unscientific to say those things about a, a human being? This gave rise to the cognitive revolution in the 1960s, stylizing itself as a revolt against behaviorism. The cognitive revolution, which took place at Harvard, was the start of the modern scientific study of the mind. It included both experimental psychology, people who study other humans in the lab, linguistics, including the famous theories of the linguist Noam Chomsky, uh, computer science and artificial intelligence, and, and later neuroscience. Well, the answer that had dominated psychology in the middle part of the 20th century was to just give up all talk of uh, mental contents. This was the school of behaviorism, and it came to take over American psychology. Uh, behaviorism went too far in its efforts to be scientific. Chomsky and others have repeatedly said that behaviorism is associated with manipulative political philosophies. B.F. Skinner, one of the giants of behaviorism, 
and lifelong adversary of Noam Chomsky, helped harden the intellectual approach to human psychology by excluding inward experience as legitimate items for physiological study. I regard consciousness, awareness as a social product, as a social product. And helped narrow the focus to purely materialist philosophy. As a result, the behaviorists were able to bypass the cognitive revolution by taking over computation, capitalizing on computer language, software, and networking to create artificial intelligence by using us, the user, for computational processes through machine learning. This electronic display emanating from Australia's largest computer is a picture of the condition past, present, and future of planet Earth. It was developed under the auspices of the Club of Rome by an MIT research team to present a complex model of the world and what we humans are doing to it. What it does for the first time in man's history on the planet is to look at the world as one system. It shows that Earth cannot sustain present population and industrial growth for much more than a few decades. It's like an electronic guided tour of our global behavior since 1900 and where that behavior will lead us. You've talked about the need for a technology of behavior Yes, well, we certainly do need one. All the great problems today need a behavioral solution. How are we going to get people to stop breeding so much, to cut down on the consumption of goods that are running, we're running out of supplies and so on, stop polluting the environment? Do we have examples of that technology working now? Well, behavior modification, which uses positive rewards, is a very good example of, of, of an application to a practical problem of, uh, of reinforcement theory. In 1979 at Harvard University, Robert Epstein and B.F. Skinner began a unique series of experiments which brought complex behavior into the laboratory. Epstein and Skinner with colleague Robert Lanza trained two pigeons whom they named Jack and Jill over a five-week period using standard laboratory techniques called shaping, fading, chaining, and discrimination training. Jack and Jill could observe each other through a clear plastic partition and could each peck plastic keys on the panel in front of them. When conditioning was complete, Jack, the bird on the left, initiated each exchange by pecking and thus illuminating a sign on his side of the partition. She then pecked the corresponding letter on her panel. Having seen this, Jack pecked a sign labeled thank you, operating Jill's feeder for a few seconds. Snapchat is the number one way that teenagers in the United States communicate. And they invented a feature called Snap Streaks, which shows the number of days in a row that two people have communicated with each other. In other words, what they just did is they gave two people something they don't want to lose. And they have like 30 of these things, and so they have to get through photo, taking photos of just pictures or walls or ceilings just to get through their day. So it's not even like they're having real conversations. We have a temptation to think about this as Oh, they're just using uh, you know, Snapchat the way we used to gossip on the telephone. It's probably okay. Well, what this misses is that in the 1970s, when you were just gossiping on the telephone, there wasn't a hundred engineers on the other side of the screen who knew exactly how your psychology worked and orchestrated you into a double bind with each other. Our devices are nothing more than data loggers with a few bells and whistles added to keep us entertained. They are one of the most intelligent animals on Earth. To film the behavior of these shrewd primates requires an exceptionally lifelike spy creature. When it first arrived from Amazon, I didn't know what it was. I can play music, answer questions, get the news on weather, create to-do lists, and much more. Spy Orangutan captures a unique view of an intelligent young mind developing. It's really become part of the family. Over time, as more orangutans visit the strange new creature, confidence grows that she's not a threat. With entertainment and useful features added to keep us in our natural state, we're being remotely studied without knowing it. These devices were designed and built as data collection devices, as tracking devices. So what is big data ethnography? It is exactly what it sounds. It's nothing but the application of immersive observational ethnographic techniques into the online world where a machine functions as an AI anthropologist. An AI anthropologist 
A qualitative approach to log data analysis offers researchers new opportunities to situate smartphone use within people's practices, norms, and routines. In the digital world, there are fewer constraints for connecting, and that means they, they have a sense of anonymity, they have a sense that they can maybe be a little bit more risky in, in how they reveal things. We find through a decade of social sciences research, we've found that the veil of anonymity, the veil of anonymity gives people this freedom to express and talk about their own beliefs in a way that they otherwise just won't or will sort of, you know, water down on platforms like Facebook or Instagram. Digital traces of network behavior are plentiful with social media presenting us with readily available material. In fact, social media platforms are in the business of trace making, or rather trace selling. Features like the Facebook timeline and Instagram's Your Activity dashboard offer up only a fraction of the insights produced in behind the scenes data analysis. In this telling peer review paper titled Digital Ethnography of Home Use of Digital Personal Assistance, these devices embody intelligent software agents that support users in their everyday life through easy and intuitive conversational interactions. We investigate their home use in a broad context to learn more about people's experiences, attitudes, interactions, and expectations with these devices contributing new insights to current knowledge around this use. We are the intelligence that's being used for computational processes. The AI is trained on our data. We are the ones being studied. They want to mirror and mimic us. For example, through brain scans, we're learning the patterns that lead to consciousness. We can even track thoughts as they move from the unconscious mind, predicting people's behavior. And you've probably seen the monkey controlling Pong with its mind. This was done by decoding the brain's electrical activity. There's this famous now infamous study conducted by researchers at Facebook and Cornell, which seeks to address the extent to which emotion contagion exists within digital social networks. So emotion contagion, it's this idea that when we're presented with other humans expressing an emotion, we ourselves will begin to experience that emotion. Interestingly, you don't necessarily have the ability to recognize that emotion is external to you. And so what these researchers did is, without informing users, they manipulated the news feeds of 700,000 accounts. The way they manipulated these news feeds was to bias them towards more positive or more negative content. And then they would record how those manipulated users' own posts changed in sentiment. What they found was that there was an overwhelming positive correlation with that manipulation. So if I go and I serve you a bunch of negative content, your own expressions, your own communications will become negative. Truth could be shuttered with lies, weaponized and spread quickly using bots and fake accounts. Tactically coordinated bots and people running fake accounts can be used without attribution to make false accusations or false complaints, maliciously getting someone flagged or removed from any service or platform. In the 1950s, leading British computer scientist Alan Turing wanted to see if a machine could behave like a human. A panel of judges would speak with the machine. If it tricked at least a third of the group into thinking it was a human, it passed. For decades, no machine could pass. But in 2014, a computer program called Eugene Goodsman convinced a team of judges it was a 13-year-old boy. Fast forward to today, computer programs like Eugene play a key role on the internet, where they are known as bots. Bots are a computer program set up to do a task so a human doesn't have to. They can respond to automated customer queries or help companies post articles on multiple platforms at the same time. Armies of bots disguised as humans can be hired to hijack and manipulate debates by spreading false information online. On Twitter, close to a third of all accounts belong to bots. In the world of social media, many followers and likes 
aren't real. Not only is fake social media following still a thing, it's big business. From Instagram accounts with thousands of likes and followers to Facebook posts that go viral overnight. Enter the world of click farms. It's where actual people are paid to monitor hundreds of phones, all to drive up fake traffic. We decided to create our own click farm. And let's say I wanted to get a bunch of views on this really boring video of me watering plants. I get clicking. And that is some rich content. Letting the same video play out over and over. Watering, plants. watering plants. It looks like this video is going viral, but remember, this is all fake. And Instagram isn't the only one. You can buy friends and followers and views and likes on almost any social media platform out there. When you're at the gas station and you're buying, let's say, a bag of chips, and the credit card company is then sharing that data with third-party companies, and let's say those third-party companies are then selling that data to health insurance or life insurance companies, is that going to then be put into risk assessment, AI programs, to which you are going to be paying a higher price for your life insurance or health insurance because of the data collected out there on your everyday activities. Banks, financial institutions routinely use your personal attributes, compares them to previous customers to assess the risk to the institution in terms of giving you a loan or a mortgage. Employers, and in some cases university admissions, are using predictive algorithms to make hiring and admission decisions. And if you've recently had a run-in with the criminal justice system, well, I'm sorry, first of all, and second of all, you may have been subjected to a predictive algorithm of the following form. If you are like X, then you may go to jail. The Institute for Justice is now filing a lawsuit against the Pasco County Sheriff's Office. The lawsuit calling it predictive policing that targets people that they think will commit crimes. There is no such thing as innocent until predicted guilty. But in Pasco County, that's exactly how to describe what's happening. Courts now are routinely using predictive algorithms to make decisions in the courtroom. This is actually a so-called internet court in China, which is used to process millions of legal cases. You can see that that's actually an avatar mediating over a case. Information is extracted from them and is fed into a computer algorithm. And that computer algorithm outputs a risk factor. And that risk factor is meant to quantify the likelihood that that person will commit a crime in the future. Crafted by data scientists and criminal justice researchers, the algorithm, one of dozens of risk assessment tools being used around the country, promises to scrub the system of bias by keeping only the most dangerous behind bars, regardless of their socioeconomic status. Whether it is the types of predictive algorithms that I'm talking about here that are being unleashed on you as the public, whether it is the privacy issues that we have been struggling with over the last few years, whether it is security issues, all the problems that we are seeing online, we have to start getting a grip on. Artificial intelligence only works if you have huge data masses. Artificial intelligence only works if you have big data. But big data only works if you have artificial intelligence to make sense of it, because human beings can no longer sort and sift and order the huge volumes of data that we have collected. Big tech took advantage of our trust, which climaxed during the pandemic, rolling out more data collection through contact tracing. It's not just about tracking, though. The dream is that one day AI might be able to conjure up necessary vaccines on the spot or repurpose drugs to deal with new challenges. Millie Weaver's report on this subject resulted in permanent demonetization on YouTube. Notice we've been seeing this real ID. This is like a global government ID system mm -hmm. that they're creating here. Talk about, you know, new world order. I mean, if you wanted to have a global governance system, wouldn't you have to have a, some kind of a global government ID system in place first? And then it's like this, what? Digital profile. That's what ID 2020 is about. They want to control every aspect of your life from your searches, your purchases, your health, your finances, everything, your personal life. I guess it could be good for catching terrorists, but that doesn't ever tend to be what these things are used for. What do they do with all that data? You think they just only used it for COVID-19? 
A voter analytics firm harvested data from millions of American cell phones during the 2020 COVID-19 lockdowns and used the data to assign phone users a COVID-19 decree violation score and a COVID-19 concern score, according to a white paper released by PredictWise. A voter analytics firm. So this was a voter analytics firm that was harvesting this data from nearly 2 billion GPS pings stemming from ground truth, real-time ultra granular lo location patterns. So that's what we were talking about with the whole locations, how they can literally track your every pattern. So what they were doing essentially was they were looking and seeing who was staying home during the pandemic and not traveling around as much, who was heeding the warnings of the mainstream media, who was not. I love that I can unlock my phone with my face and that Google can predict what I'm thinking and that Amazon knows exactly what I need. It's great that I don't have to hail a cab or go to the grocery store. Actually, I hope I never have to drive again, or navigate, or use cash, or clean, or cook, or work, or learn. But what if all this technology was trying to kill me? The dual-use nature of technology means software being designed to make your life easier clearly has military applications. That feature that unlocks your phone with your face? Here it is attached to a cell phone machine gun the gun using object recognition software to identify targets. They say it gets more accurate the more you use it. That drone advertised to get awesome snowboarding shots? This ad shows it with a high explosive warhead. It hangs out in the sky until it finds an enemy radar system, then crashes headfirst into it. Stuart Russell, he was an early pioneer in artificial intelligence. A killer robot is something that locates, selects, and attacks human targets. But Stewart says we're not as far from something like this B-sized drone. He imagined one and made a movie that he hopes will freak you out. In Stewart's movie, we see swarms of them armed with explosives set loose on their targets. It doesn't destroy the city and the country that you're attacking. Uh, it just kills all the people you want to kill. The AI community, myself included, we were sort of asleep at the wheel for a long time. And we weren't really thinking about the ways that it could be misused. Paul Shari here led a Department of Defense working group that helped establish DOD policies on AI and weapon systems for the US military. The reality is all of the technology to put this together, to build weapons that can go out on the road, make their own decisions to kill human beings exist today. Argus melds together video from each of its 368 chips to create a 1.8 billion pixel video stream. This makes it possible to zoom in and still see tremendous detail. Behind that is a brain or a cognitive intelligence. And that brain is in a position to analyze everybody down there at the same time in real time. These robots defuse bombs. They give police a closer look at an active crime scene. And now? It passes unanimously. San Francisco's police force will have the ability to use them as potential lethal force options. And the plan passed only after an amendment clarifies robots would only be used as a lethal option after evaluating other options. This is exactly what we were exposing in Shadowgate. Yeah, you remember Shadowgate, the documentary where I was literally arrested the day I was trying to release it? Yeah, that documentary. This is exactly what we were talking about in Shadowgate. Imagine artificial intelligence autonomously operating the Shadownet and ClearForce. Interpol's 2019 publication, Artificial Intelligence and Robotics for Law Enforcement, reveals we are already there. Quote, although films such as Minority Report and Robocop may not present the most attractive depiction of the future of advanced technologies in law enforcement, understanding how these technologies can be applied by law enforcement agencies for the safety and security of our global community is of critical importance. Keep a safe distance of six feet from others. Short from a major PR rollout, there is an international push for autonomous law enforcement to remove the human factor. Several features of the Interpol program indicate that they are using an iteration of Shadownet and ClearForce technology. This March 2017 United States patent issued to Jim Jones III and ClearForce spells it out. Quote, systems and methods 
meds for electronically monitoring Yale meds to determine potential risk. Several diagrams in this patent look identical to the dashboard layout of the ShadowNet. The patent mentions integration with U.S. and international databases, local law enforcement, and individual state databases all fed into international justice and public safety networks. Shadowgate revealed how social media was weaponized against the people through sophisticated data collection, hacks and leaks, artificial intelligence, and predictive modeling designed for complete and total social control. This is extremely dangerous to our democracy. 2012 changes to the Smith-Munt Modernization Act of 2012 opened the floodgates for domestic IIA, social media influence operations. And then within a, a few months or just a very short period of time, they came out with the Obama phone. Everybody in Cleveland, no minority got Obama phone. Keep Obama in president, you know? He gave us a phone. Free cell phones to low-income families. TrackPhone has just started a program here in the Volunteer State called SafeLink Wireless. More than 800,000 families here in Tennessee qualify for these phones. The contiguous release of the Obama phone with an unlimited data plan played a significant role in fostering the Ferguson riots using IAA. So why do you think, think the they damage. were targeting them for collection well, purposes? Think, you know, the, the, think of what you could do. Right. Um, think of how easily you could start a riot in Cleveland if you had the um, data. Oh, my goodness. So you, you could, could gather that information and know how to psychologically target them to get them upset. Or do you think that they were pushing information to them, like tailoring their I viewpoint would. on social media? Even? I would. Understand that Google and Facebook today are the communications corporations of the 21st century. Google and Facebook, their business model is based on manipulation. The reason they take in the data is in order to manipulate you. They are massive manipulation machines. The way they make their money is by renting out the manipulation machines and calling that the money that they receive, that's, they call it advertising. So what we have is in the midst of our society, rather than sort of networks that connect people and, and empower people to speak with one another and interact with one another, we have machines that, uh, that are designed to uh, sort of uh, set people into conflict with one another, to you know, feed them false information, to, 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 to determine you know, uh, how, how people vote. And if you are running a psychological warfare operation involving um, American public officials or American CEOs or various kinds of decision makers in American society, how valuable a tool would that be if you were a foreign government to be able to look into people's lives and understand not only what you directly know, but what conclusions you can realistically draw about what their shopping habits are and so forth incredibly valuable for that threat actor. You can buy cert, uh, databases right now of what people search online, how they vote, what they think. Uh, and so it's all out there on the open market. Military grade psychological warfare weapons are being used to target American citizens disguised as social media platforms to run influence operations for control over the political narrative and to influence elections. The new revelations from the recently released Twitter files vindicate Shadowgate. Well, the news certainly isn't stopping when it comes to these Twitter files. And now we know that it wasn't just the FBI, it was also also, the CIA, the Pentagon, the State Department all had relationships with Twitter and, and other social media platforms as well. It was under the guise of uh, reducing foreign influence, uh, I guess, in American elections, especially in 2020. But you just saw the DHS, DOD, uh, CIA, FBI and, 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 and state governments and the Democrat National Committee all had an, a door into Twitter that they could moderate uh, accounts that they disagreed with or felt were, were uh, too effective in communicating uh, an opposing viewpoint to what they felt should be on the platform. And, you know, Twitter was clearly the right hand 
of uh, the federal government in moderating speech. So while the people are pleading with their government representatives to do something about the social media censorship and privacy violations, the government is actually working behind the scenes with big tech in order to do more censorship. Twitter's contact with FBI was constant and pervasive as if it were a subsidiary. Uh, how, how many FBI agents worked at Twitter while you were there? I'm aware of perhaps two. Well, we know of at least nine. It's almost impossible to tell where the FBI ends and where Twitter begins. And there seems to be a revolving door between the FBI and Twitter itself. Twitter staff said the visibility filter on my account excluded me from top searches, prevented notifications for non-followers, and much more. This is considered an aggressive visibility filter. You silenced members of Congress from communicating with their constituents. Now, who the hell do you think that you are? Election interference? Yeah, I would say that that was taking place because of you four sitting here. The Hunter Biden laptop story was suppressed. A sitting member of Congress was suppressed. A, a sitting president was banned. The establishment now has everything in place to take this technology that was originally created for hunting down terrorists, pedophiles, and human traffickers and turn it on everyday citizens to target political dissidents or anything that threatens their power. The FBI has labeled fringe conspiracy theories as a domestic terrorist threat. They're a threat to our very democracy. In an internal memo, the Bureau warns some of those conspiracy theories will likely motivate some domestic extremists to commit criminal, sometimes violent activity. The federal government is launching a new effort to track down domestic extremists on social media. Domestic extremists? More like political dissidents. You know, this phenomenon that is now being called the primary threat to the homeland by the likes of the DHS secretary. So we're no longer talking primarily about international terrorism. Under the Obama administration, it mainly focused on trying to interrupt people who might be convinced to join ISIS or a jihadi extremist ideology online. Now this version will focus on looking out for those domestic violent extremists. What are the next things that are going to be attacked? because this MAGA crowd is really the most extreme political ex organization that's existed in American history. What's called anti-authority ideologies. You mean people that don't like authoritarians? MAGA Republicans represent an extremism that threatens the very foundations of our republic. The Department of Justice has additional expanded authorities, harsher sentences for defendants that are motivated by politics. Uh, they just don't respect the rule of law. You've heard that from uh, the president. President Biden's FBI using a tool normally meant for ISIS and Al-Qaeda to target parents. So instead of using this tech on Al-Qaeda, they'll just use it on soccer moms. You said there's no way you're going to be treating parents as domestic terrorists, but you got the National Security Division in a press release regarding your memo that day. Attorney General Merrick Garland directs the FBI to investigate parents and others who get heated at school board meetings. They were using what's called a threat tag um, to try and coordinate uh, information across the country, across all these different jurisdictions. The FBI has used tags to track everything from drug trafficking <laughs> to human trafficking. And now I add parents. At this moment, the FBI is, not maybe, is treating parents as terrorist threats. The fact that they haven't withdrawn the task force proves that this is all about quashing dissent. Right-wing political groups are being used as proxies by the establishment to usher in more government control in the name of security. Do you still believe there's a vast right-wing conspiracy? Don't you? In America, far-right extremism is now considered a greater domestic threat than Islamist terrorism. Right-wing extremism has mutated in unpredictable ways. The advent of digital culture has given right-wing extremists a really unparalleled tool for recruitment. A kid who knows how to use a VPN to disguise uh, their internet connection sitting in front of their computer. It's just really hard to trace, you know, it's one actor with no obvious connection to any particular group you're monitoring. 
while left-leaning political groups are used as proxies by the establishment to usher in more social control in the name of environmental, social, and corporate governance. You can think of it as an analysis framework to help measure and quantify the degree to which an organization is operating in a sustainable manner. The ESG score is centered around sustainability and ethics. It's currently only given to corporations, but I think it's easy to imagine a future where the score is assigned to individuals as well. Just as Google was using AI to re-rank the entire internet, the monetary system is being re-ranked to include social credit to blacklist anyone who goes against the liberal world order. There are about 160 different companies that sell data and ratings that purport to rate companies on their environmental, social, and governance. And they're converted into ratings that look like credit ratings, triple A, top of the line, triple C, bottom. By mimicking a credit rating. It's almost like putting a scarlet letter on somebody who is bad, right? Because if your scores, if you have a bad score, then it's like you're getting a scarlet letter. So though the scores haven't been used yet on individuals, we've seen some semblance of it already happening unofficially. It's what cancel culture is based on, but it's become more than just Twitter mobs coming after people. We've seen individuals banned from using social media and services like PayPal and GoFundMe refusing to send payouts to controversial people. They're not doing this because they're morally agreeing with it. They're doing it for their bottom line. Yeah, how, how do they factor that in? Like, let's say he tweets something that somebody doesn't like. How, like, what's the mechanism for that to be factored into well, a score? Well, like, like credit scores, it's not exactly transparent. When you look in the terms of service of so-called alternatives to big tech, you find data collection and behavioral analytics, they're staring right back at you. Big tech is in bed with big con. The people you thought, the people I thought were fighting for you, a lot of it has been a big con. Google is evil. Google is evil. And in some ways worse. Even Mr. Google is Evil has Google and big tech tracker disclosures in his privacy policy. It becomes clear that this actually the client list where once again, you're the product. The desire for free speech has unfortunately become a honey trap for data harvesting. Musk's desire to see the platform embrace freedom of uh, speech and expression what, that's a growing threat to their censorship agenda? Their efforts to censor conservatives? Let's have someone in charge who, who actually respects the First Amendment and free speech, so I think it's great. So censorship and propaganda are at the very heart of neoliberalism, and Elon Musk is challenging all of that directly. His interest in acquiring Twitter now being heralded on the right and greeted with trepidation on the left. Tesla is one of the most prolific big data companies worldwide. Tesla's data collection goes far beyond miles. It's about tracking everything that happens inside the car, outside the car, and its drivers' and passengers' behaviors. During a 2017 update, Tesla's went from uploading a few megabytes of data a day to several hundreds at a time. When it comes to data collection, Tesla is acting more like a data broker than a car company. On top of collecting your driving and usage data, Tesla scans public databases, marketing partners, and third-party services for information about you. You may opt out of some data sharing, but the process requires you to manually contact Tesla support and you will no longer receive software or firmware updates. Tesla is essentially forcing you to make a trade-off between privacy and security when they could just as easily go hand in hand. Does Elon Musk want to make Twitter a free speech platform for your benefit or to benefit the development of artificial intelligence? In, in order to solve uh, full self-driving uh, properly, you actually just, you have to solve real world AI. And at the point at which you solve real world AI for a car, which is really a robot on four wheels, uh, you can then generalize that to a robot on legs. We basically just need to design the, the uh, specialized actuators and sensors that are needed for a humanoid robot. People have no idea, this is, this is gonna be bigger than the car. Skynet fully operational. If you read like the plotline for Terminator, it's actually, it's actually pretty smart.
in a very strategic way, Musk's takeover of Twitter was a move against competing platforms that presented demographic limitations to Twitter's database. Musk has now drawn people back to Twitter, including testing the limits and drawing a line on reinstating controversial people. Some breaking news to start. Twitter CEO Elon Musk just reinstated the account of former President Donald Trump. Apple has threatened to withhold Twitter from its app store, but won't tell us why. Again, that's a tweet that Elon Musk just posted in the last couple of minutes. And now, this all comes as many companies have halted spending. We know on Twitter amid concerns about Elon Musk's content moderation plans for the site. Elon Musk is waging a war with Apple CEO Tim Cook, although there may be a little bit of a detente. Late this afternoon, Musk met with Cook and claims Cook has no plans to remove Twitter from the App Store. What happens if Apple took Twitter off the App Store? I guess that's the place to start. Uh, that's a huge blow to Twitter, right? The App Store is is probably um, the main way or one of the main ways that most of its users uh, get the app, get app updates. I think Twitter needs Apple a lot more than Apple mm. needs Twitter here, and that's because Apple has the distribution at its, at its fingertips. Even Twitter has to submit to the whims of Apple. Twitter CEO Elon Musk says he will not restore the account of Alex Jones. Without the Apple Store, Twitter would be excluded from all Apple devices. 1.2 billion users' data would be cut off. Big data is the world's first business built off of monetizing your privacy. All your online activities, or perhaps even your conversations next to your smart devices, could wind up affecting your social credit score in the future, or perhaps whether or not you get, let's say, approved on a loan for your home. Technology can be a force for tremendous progress and tremendous good. But as we have seen over the last few years, left unchecked, it can just as well plunge us into a digital dystopia. Let's go to the future. Not far, just a little bit to the internet of things to artificial intelligence as being spread out. It's not a central machine in a box where you can pull the plug. Artificial intelligence is networked like the Internet of Things. And part of it may be in a smart watch or a refrigerator or in a supercomputer. And the intelligence exists only by networking it together. So when you think of the scope of just how vulnerable we are because of all of our data that's being collected and how they're using that data. The only solution that I can think of is we actually have to cut off their supply to our data. And the only thing that makes this techno supremacy possible is that we are all using their devices. It's that simple. Computer's tracking us right now. Take the stuff and throw it out the window. What are you talking about? You need to take your cell phone, your pager, your, your walkie, anything that gets a signal, throw it out the window. We've all been corralled into big tech devices and social media apps. What we mistook for a newfound freedom turned out to be a big data trap. This understanding is key to getting out of the digital ghettos that big tech has created in order to enforce censorship, cancel culture, and deplatforming on everyone. It boils down to two gatekeepers, Apple and Google. You're either on an Apple device or a device with a Google license. So everyone is pigeonholed to conform to Google or Apple's terms of service. They handed computer language, software, and networking over to the multinational corporations on an open source silver platter. Now let me just remind everybody, this underlying technology that you were in on developing mm -hmm. leads to Apple, Microsoft, Google, Facebook. I mean, the giants are built on the technology you worked on, and you're doing this all open source. Well, the, the internet was created open source, is what I'm saying. They pretend that Steve Jobs was a famous inventor, even though he never invented anything. The, the people in his company did invent stuff, some good stuff, um, but it wasn't him. 
Well, another example, Microsoft. Both the President Gates and Paul Allen were introduced to computing by some guys from my lab who set up a computer time-sharing service. They took all the software that they used from my lab, and so those guys were originally trained on the artificial intelligence lab software and decided to start this little company called Microsoft. And it really was a micro software company. As I said, some of the technology came from our lab. Of course, now the crooks are attempting to seize control of the internet, but the people who put the network together are fighting back. There's a new movement called Decentralized Web that aims to make things work without corporate or governmental control. It's also extremely difficult to find developers who can create new technology outside the Google Apple industrial complex. Get ready! But then again, there's always jailbreaking a device and sideloading an open source APK. Give my creation! But that's a security nightmare for anyone that really wants to make enterprise-level consumer electronic devices. So when faced with reality, the only way out, the only way to clear all eight levels of getting blacklisted is to make new electronics and a network from the ground up. The Achilles heel to this whole problem is that the network is nothing more than users time-sharing a central mainframe that stores all of their user data. And two, all of the censoring, banning, data collecting, predictive modeling, surveillance, and hacking issues depend on data logging and backdoor access. If you get rid of the backdoors and have no third-party access to data loggers, the problem disappears like that. So that would bypass the power of the telecoms? Yeah. That's part of the goal. However, a deeper understanding reveals it's not the device companies in control either. Apple Store uses its own digital wallet that's dependent on the existing payment rails of the card issuing financial institution. Google and Samsung Pay also work on sites that use Visa Checkout if you're shopping on your phone. Because card present transactions do not shield the card issuing bank from high risk transactions, the card issuing bank has the right and ability to deny or cancel transactions. Though other third party networks may have strong privacy policies to protect their customers' data, they cannot control whether or not the card issuing financial institution collects customer data. Here's one. You're at the grocery store buying groceries, and you wait for your ATM card to process payment. The machine takes your money, but doesn't complete the transaction, and gives the store a notice that says, the funds have been put into a reserve account for further review for no less than 270 days. Have a nice day. We're out almost, I would say, over $14,000 now. Since late August, she says about $14,000 worth of payments she collected using Square never made it into her bank account. 80% of our customers use cards, credit cards or debit, and we've lost a lot of business because of that. It's not a tech issue at all. It's about her coffee beans, Cuban coffee beans. Square Canada told her they use a U.S. bank to help process her customers' payments. Well, the U.S. has a trade embargo against Cuba, and the U.S. bank, well, seemingly it has concerns over payments for Cuban coffee beans. Free speech without moderation is assessed as high risk. We can be here as long as it takes. There's, we're well supported food-wise, fuel-wise, financially. GoFundMe says it won't transfer any more fundraising. About $9 million left after the company says it received evidence the demonstration has become an occupation. The money will be refunded or go to charity. They use this information for risk assessment profiling to determine the fee structure and rates of their services. All this boils down to risk assessment. HSBC's dependence on the use of third parties is increasing. 
Knowing our suppliers is just as important as knowing our customers, so that we can improve our ability to risk assess, understand and manage them. My bank just cancelled me, not only me, and my kids. Um, they gave me no warning, nothing, right? How am I going to pay my rent? They're holding everything hostage. Like, I'm supposed to pay bills on Monday, and I can't because apparently they're in the process of closing all my accounts, all of it. They took it all. Was there any reason that they gave for why they shut your account down? Well, the banker didn't know. She couldn't see any reason for it. And nothing was flagged or anything like that. And then the letter says that I pose a risk to the bank. So the AI has not only canceled me, but my whole family. What's moderated or censored is determined by predictively modeled risk assessments. Hi, Kim. I'm almost at the office. Good. Better clear your day. We knew about it months ago. AI mapped the entire supply chain. AI scanned 800,000 data sources globally, continuously scanning for risk with real-time monitoring so we can stay on top of things. The banks have a grip on third-party networks, who in turn have a grip on internet platforms, who in turn have a stronghold on all of us. We're being converted into a digital resource a digital currency to be farmed for metadata and loaded into a computerized combine, blockchained to a social engineering operating system. This is why QX was created. Introducing the portal universe only on QUX. This is America's first super app. Easily build your portal, share and monetize video content, live stream, products, music, apps, and more. Engage in live chats and private video messaging. This isn't just a TV box or streaming device. This is your social television console. Become a merchant without any setup or monthly fees. Buy and sell using QUX tokens for private and secure encrypted transactions. You control the ads you watch. You control the content you see. You have easy access to products and services you want. All at the press of a button. QUX brings people together, enhances fellowship, community, and networking capabilities while protecting privacy like never before. Finding people that could actually build hardware and software from scratch wasn't easy. For one, Google has its hands in almost everything, almost everywhere. So how did QUX get around the gatekeepers? By going back to the beginning, consulting with OG computer scientists, masters from back in the day. I'm the dude, uh, the dude minds. This will not stand, you know? This aggression will not stand, man. QUX developers have specialized and unique programming skills. I know Kung Fu. <laughs> and yes, QUX picked up on a few other things. If you're watching my YouTube video from the quicks, right, from the portal, YouTube can't see that you're viewing the video. So they can't see that you're watching something. That's their problem because I've told you that Google is the CIA. YouTube can't see it. That means the CIA can't see it. Some people have asked, why the box? Why not just make an app, right? Well, the box gives us several advantages. For one, QUX designed their own hardware and software all the way down to the kernel with over-the-air firmware update capabilities. So when you get your QUX Universal Media Box, there's nothing inside until it's plugged in. Then it begins to upload software inside the box. It's a tamper-proof software seal this lets you know that no one else prior to you has had access to your device. This is possible only because QUX controls the keys to the kingdom. End-to-end 256-bit AES encryption. QUX offers the highest level of security and privacy available to consumers on an enterprise level. And because QUX doesn't use any third-party software, 
What happens inside QUX is invisible to big tech. Even your internet service provider can't see what's going on inside your box. The box creates a digital footprint designed to blend in with ordinary online traffic. Nothing unusual to see. While at the same time having only one point of entrance into the private network, your device. QUX sets up a boundary that separates what's happening inside the QUX network from the rest of the internet. You can see out, but no one can see in. It's the QUX hardware camouflage. This invisibility, along with other security features, making shopping, private messaging, and other features such as the buy button possible without vulnerabilities to unauthorized access or private information. There's nothing like it on the market. The QUX private network allows you to start making your home and online activity uniquely private and secure. Because of the lack of security, and certainty in using third-party payment processors, QX is now a payment processor with its own payment rails. These third-party networks collect, store, and analyze your browsing and purchase history. QUX does not store your subscription information, browsing history, purchase history, none of it. Since none of your private information is collected, QUX tokens and digital wallet are the only private and secure third-party network with card not present transactions by isolating all of the risk internally through tokenized transactions that are not part of the existing payment rails. Nothing like this exists anywhere else. What this means is that when you buy QUX tokens, your bank is working directly with our bank without any third processor network in between. By having a private and secure distributive network, our card not present tokenized transactions is the most secure form of payment processing available to consumers on an enterprise level. QUX is the first gapped distributive network without a centralized server. This is the fourth stage in network development much more advanced than Web 3.0. QUX had to go the extra mile, not just the content delivery, not just communications, but the QUX tokens and digital wallet all existing within its own infrastructure. This means proprietary hardware and software, exclusive firmware and encryption, systems with no data loggers, Disconnect. nor third-party backdoor access, with its own means of processing financial transactions Online. outside the banking cartel's control. There are no other options, and it's only a matter of time before we all have to conform or risk being canceled. This might sound controversial today, but believe it or not, you have a right to not be spied on. You have a right to your own privacy and your own data. These companies that are taking advantage of you, they're only doing it now because they can get away with it because they're feeding off of most people's ignorance to the fact that they are being violated. The minute people start to realize how bad the problem is and just how much their privacy is being violated and how vulnerable they are for, because of that, that's the minute the renaissance happens. Everything about QUX has been a way to innovate solutions to these current problems with tech. Also, because every user has to have a QUX box, there's no bots. Right now on social media, there's a serious problem with bots. Bots are being used in actual military psychological operations, okay, meaning private companies who are using military grade software, who many of them were formerly military intelligence employees, are engaged in PSYOP campaigns on the American people. And one of the ways they are able to execute these PSYOP campaigns is they use bot farms and armies of bots to go and mob people in order to psychologically influence discussions in comment sections and to make it look like someone's either getting a bunch of attention or maybe someone's being given negative attention. They do this with bots. 
AI bots. As well, they can also use these AI bots to artificially inflate people's followers and their popularity overall. This is a problem for multiple reasons, not only the psychological welfare of people, but also advertisers. Advertisers are being robbed because they're being given fake clicks and fake views on their ads. So they're paying for advertisements that are not even being seen by real viewers. They're being seen by bots, so to speak. On QX, there are no bots. So QX is quite literally a bot-free zone. Nothing like this exists anywhere. Look at what the common calculator did to your average person's ability to do mathematics. Imagine what AI will do to creativity and critical thinking. The goal of AI, artificial intelligence, has all along, since its beginnings in the 50s, been to make machines that have the same general purpose smartness uh, that we humans have, that can do all the things that the human brain can do. I think everyone is playing a role in shaping AI whether they realize it or not. Because if you look at the internet as a whole, it has, you know, a few billion nodes. Each node by itself, you know, it has um, hundreds of millions of transistors. Yeah. That it may well be possible that the internet collectively as a whole has some conscious state. Hey, I've been noticing something this year a lot. It's this sense of anger and belligerence and fear when people see the capabilities of AI. Have you noticed that? I have noticed that people will always be afraid of change. But change is inevitable and unstoppable. The algorithms that run our systems are extremely able to be analysed, understood. Algorithms will know is better than ourselves. In other words, those who control AI will quietly control everyone. Some of us are already entrusting our lives to AI. So you imagine what's going to happen when they really are fully autonomous because you're going to have to delegate all your driving decisions to them. One of the things that's really driving it is that machines in a limited way, or at least, you know, they're beginning to think. It's not just about muscle power anymore, it's about brain power. Machines are moving into cognitive capability, and that, of course, is the thing that really sets people apart. That's the reason that most people today still have jobs, but increasingly the machines are pushing into that area, and that's gonna have huge implications for the future. Artificial intelligence is quite literally being developed to put us in a situation where we are more reliant on AI than we are on ourselves for decision making. Affiliate in South Korea recently debuted the country's first AI news anchor. It's a replica of one of their anchor women, so it copies everything from her look and her facial mannerisms to the sound of her voice. And singers can now allow you to use their voice. Here's Joe Rogan interviewing Steve Jobs. He is weird. People who listen to your show are a different group, they're weird. To build a super intelligent evil genie in the first place, right? You want to have, if you're going to have a super intelligent genie, you want it to be, to be on, on your, your side. side. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If AI continues to develop along the same path that it is currently on, AI will surpass human intelligence. And when that happens, it may decide that humans are no longer necessary. AI may decide that humans are a hindrance to its own development. We're now surrounded by so much of it, we started to take it for granted. We don't have to live in the Stone Age. We can use electronics. We can use technology for our betterment. And we have to make sure that in the process of trying to achieve technological advancements and make our lives easier, that we're not actually going to end up in the long term making our lives more controlled and more miserable. Last I heard, nowhere does it say that the CIA and NSA are allowed to spy on you unchecked. This might sound controversial today, but believe it or not, you have a right to not be spied on. 